point it's one of those things it's it's complex enough that you all like no matter how long you've researched it you're always are still learning about it um but the more i learn about it the the more bullish i get um and at the same time i kind of view it as the only realistic method to change some of our monetary aspect that we're kind of stuck in this local maximum of money uh where transaction speeds are very fast but settlement speeds of anything scarce like gold have been very slow and so we've kind of had a century and a half of necessary abstraction and that's easy to centralize and control and leverage um and bitcoin is the first and, and really only credible way to break out of that so while I'm never 100% sure on any asset, you know, there's 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 all sorts of challenges and, and frictions that can happen. Um, but if it's not Bitcoin, I don't really know what else it would be. Basically that, you know, once the telegraph was invented, um, that allowed for rapid transmission of data. Um, but transactions require a lot less data than settlements. So it's easy to, you know, with more something as simple as Morse code, you can do a transaction with someone. Whereas you know, digital settlement or fast global settlement requires something like Bitcoin, which, you know, if you look at what Bitcoin requires, uh, it requires much more complex uh, math, much more complex processors, much more complex um, telecommunication systems. I mean, the internet, which didn't exist back then, but then not even just the internet, you need h relatively high bandwidth uh, ways of transmitting data to, to have the kind of the throughput we have today with Bitcoin. Uh, and then you need certain encryption methods that, you know, the, the latest encryption method that Bitcoin uses wasn't invented or released until like 2001, right? So it's kind of like Bitcoin came almost as quickly as it could have based on the the bandwidth, the processing, the encryption methods that all kind of came together. So I would argue that it's inevitable that something like the telegraph would come way before Bitcoin. And because that happens, that creates this window, which in our case was a century and a half. Maybe if there's alien races, maybe they maybe they had a shorter window, maybe they have a longer window, but that window is going to exist. And in that window, it greatly amplifies the power of those that run money, right? Because now you necessitate mm -hmm. abstraction. If you can transfer value, if you can make transactions very quickly, but you can't settle gold very quickly, um, then those who are keeping the ledgers and running things are basically have a monopoly status now. Uh, and a, a government, you know, has trouble enforcing rules on all of its individuals, but it can easily re enforce rules on a handful of banks. Um, basically, it's, it's a thousand fold less entities to go after. You can see all banks have to do this rule. Um, and so governments are able to centralize their banking systems and basically have a monopoly. And that's how we end up in this world of 160 different fiat currencies, which are all these, these little bubbles. And then outside of the top 10 currencies or so, currencies aren't really accepted anywhere else. So for example, Thai bot, Egyptian pounds, even currencies of wealthy countries like the like Norway. If I go around in New Jersey trying to spend Norway physical currency, right. it's actually gonna be quite challenging to get that off my hands. The saleability is extremely low outside of its own country and maybe a couple neighboring countries. Um, and so we've been in this environment where technology, the, the order that it had to happen in, um, and for quite a while has put us in this kind of local maximum. And, you know, the invention of Bitcoin is the first credible way to end that era. We've, we've now, after another century and a half from the telegraph, we now have digital settlement. So we can, we have a ledger that is decentralized rather than centralized, and you can send bare asset final settlement around. So it's not based on debt. It's not based on credit. It's not based on an IOU. It's actually just finally um, settled through the software mm -hmm. logic and control. And that is, you know, it was inevitable that Bitcoin would happen. Now the question is, is, is it inevitable that Bitcoin wins, right? I can picture a world where say the, the person who figured out Bitcoin was like a scammer. Right. Imagine if someone was as smart as Satoshi, but they gave themselves a pre-mine or something right. or or spent their coins or just had a terrible personality, never disappeared and revealed who they were. And, you know, I can imagine a world where the second currency instead kind of overtakes the first one. Right. If the first one was kind of launched poorly. Um, but I think in some way, this is now a technology that exists. We're fortunate that Bitcoin was the first one rather than kind of a scammy one being first um, that allowed the the network effect to accumulate on a good system uh, without having to be disrupted hopefully and so we had this this is like the first real shot to get out of this century and a half window we've been in um, and so i think it's important to keep analyzing risks things that could prevent that uh, and i think it's important for people to do what they can to support that system mm -hmm. 
Um, you know, I think it's important for companies to build on it. I think it's important for people to, um, you know, talk about it. Uh, they can they can let their politicians know that they're in favor of it. There's all sorts of little things that people can do around the margins that give Bitcoin the breathing room it needs to get out of its like you know child state and into you know the more large and liquid and secure it gets, the the better shot it has that this is actually going to continue taking off. When you see a lot of smart people into crypto, a lot of it is because they themselves can benefit from it. They're the ones that are kind of issuing tokens and then basically being able to sell them before they've actually built a product. So one of the big challenges in the crypto space is that if you look at traditional venture capital, uh, you know, accredited investors or, or, or founders of companies themselves are locking up their equity for many years in most cases. And their only realistic way to, to get out from, from that situation is either the company is successful enough to go public and they can begin selling shares or um, the company gets acquired by another business. So basically a bunch of professional analysts are assessing this business and decide to acquire it and bring it in part of their business. And so the outcome of that investment is largely tied to the success of the company that they've built. Whereas in crypto, you've removed the gatekeeper, uh, but that the incentive there is that you, you can sell the tokens to the public before you've actually proven the long-term viability of the project. So the founders can get rich either way, uh, whether or not the project's successful. So there are plenty of smart people that say, well, I want to get a piece of that, right? So I sold something that was the market price and, you know, I walked away rich even though I didn't build anything, right? And so uh, I think that's the biggest risk. I, th I think, you know, from the, say, the libertarian perspective, you can argue it's good that the gatekeepers are down, that, that people can, get, this is another type of market behavior that people can, can navigate. But I think that what we have to do as consumers is build up that experience that, because its gatekeepers are down, the long tail of almost everything is going to be trash, right? And that there's way more ways for VCs and founders and just to create things that keep dumping them out there. And it has to be a number of cycles of people learning to defend against that. Um, so I can see why these founders are interested in it. I, I think, and from a from a consumer perspective, there's always kind of the desire to get rich that they're that they're going to be the one that gets the you know buys the next big thing and then gets out towards the top. And, you know, obviously for every one person that does that, there are like 99 that, that don't do that. Um, the other thing I, I think I'd point out is that it's been, you know, almost 15 years um, since, since Bitcoin was released, um, about 15 years since it was proposed. Um, and the use case for things that are not money in the broad crypto space are almost nothing. Right. So there's Bitcoin, uh, there's stable coins that that's been the most effective kind of crypto technology uh, outside of Bitcoin uh, in terms of market cap volumes, uh, actually solving a, a problem for people in the real world. It, it's basically another way for an Argentinian to get dollars. Lynn Alden, a respected financial expert, believes that Bitcoin is set to go up. She thinks this because more big companies are getting into Bitcoin. There's only a limited amount of it and more regular people are starting to like it. It's kind of like when a famous chef recommends a restaurant, people pay attention. So even though Bitcoin can be a bit crazy, Lynn Alden's prediction has a lot of folks excited about the possibility of making some money with it. If you found this video helpful, make sure you hit the like button and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching.